I'm Rachel, here with Missy, who I uh, figured would leave rather quickly, or at least cause a ruckus. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I am here with my Friday Reads video for August 30th, 2019. I thought I'd start very briefly with a blast to the past with a book I talked about a couple weeks ago. I read Oksana Behave by Maria Kuznestova earlier this month for my book club, which I'm filming this uh, Thursday evening, and I just came back from book club. And as I uh, anticipated, uh, my club kind of uh, had more critical things to say about this book than I think uh, I thought when I was reading it. Uh, the vignette style is not all that conducive, I think, to book club reading because uh, we jump around in time a lot and there's not many characters who uh, make the cut from story to story, so people didn't really uh, fall for many of the characters, especially our main character, who really is a rather unlikable person. <laughs> uh, that being said, I'm really glad I love my group. We still were able to have a detailed conversation about uh, uh, Oksana as a character and things that happened to her and things that happened in the story. Uh, there was also cr more criticism than I thought about the whole autofiction uh, conceit. Apparently there's another member of the group who's uh, rather against this whole phenomenon and <laughs> figured it spoke to her not really being able to have a creative uh, mind beyond her own life. But <laughs> I'll still give uh, Kuznestova some benefit of the doubt about, uh, well, first of all, I don't know, you know, extreme details of her life anyway, but uh, anyway. <laughs> and I also didn't have as much, I don't know, I was surprised that there was some criticism of uh, her talking about real life events. Like, I don't know, particularly in a story that was about a fictional sexual assault that uh, took place on the Duke campus around their own uh, very infamous sexual assault case. Uh, but I, did, I don't necessarily think that's fair. I think it's fair game to actually talk about real life events in fiction. <laughs> But anyway, those are my quick parting thoughts here. <laughs> I think I'll also give quick thoughts on these next two books I read this week because I made two big old videos about them. <laughs> First, I have my Women in Translation 2019 pick, uh, The Remains of Love by Zeruya Shalev, translated from the Hebrew by Philip Simpson. I finally finished this book. I started it early in the month. I put it aside a lot because it's really dense stream of consciousness. It was kind of exhausting to read. <laughs> uh, with that in mind, I think I really loved uh, the themes in this book and was intrigued by some of the stuff with the characters. I'm not sure I'll ever read it again. <laughs> it's very long and dense. <laughs> anyway, this is the story of uh, Hemda Horowitz. She is a uh, dying matriarch of a family in Jerusalem. She's sort of looking back on her life, thinking about uh, her relationships, starting with uh, her father particularly. She was uh, an early kibbutznik and was sort of, uh, her upbringing was defined by this harshness. Uh, and then it sort of passes down to her relationship with her husband, uh, who was a refugee from Europe and kind of a mournful man about the lost Europe. And then her two children, Avner and Dina, whom she loved differently, and it followed them into their lives. They really were the main characters. Uh, Avner was this man who um, sort of chased this woman he didn't know because he's in a loveless marriage and he... Uh, saw this woman in the hospital uh, have a genuine loving moment with her lover, so he chased her down. I kind of think that was less uh, interesting, really, than uh, his backstory about being a public defender uh, defending Palestinians and about uh, about the difficulties of that job, you know, uh, often being against the system, about uh, which cases he'd want to take and not take, uh, just how he uh, defined his... Uh, professional life. I, I thought that was uh, a lot more interesting of a story for him. But I feel like the main story out of all of this dense stream of consciousness was about Dina, who uh, sort of was reeling from being the unloved child of Hemda, and now she has a teenage daughter who is uh, starting to pull away from her a bit, and she's decided that she wants to adopt, and it goes sort of into uh, her and people around her grappling with her motivations about why she wants to adopt and the difficulties of adoption, uh, like how, how difficult it is uh, to get a child, um, and how difficult it is to sort of uh, acclimate with that child. Uh, it was very interesting. Uh, there was just lots of uh, 
depth in there and uh, she also had an interesting backstory. Her career was somewhat in the background too. Uh, she was a medieval professor and uh, you know uh, she was writing a thesis on uh, the medieval Jews and the expulsion from Spain and so I found her uh, whole life and story the most fascinating out of uh, anything. Anyway, if you feel like I'm already rambling about this enough here, I ramble about it a much more in my official uh, Women in Translation review, and I will link that down below. Then I finished Last Night in Montreal by Emily St. John Mandel. I've been reading uh, Mandel's Backlist all month. This is her debut novel and the last one I had to complete. Unfortunately, this is my least favorite of the novels. <laughs> um, I felt like uh, the main character, Lilia, and her whole I wish to remain vanishing uh, conceit was uh, just not that compelling on its own. I feel like really uh, some of the most compelling things I found uh, in this novel were the themes that she explores so much better in Station Eleven. It's weird. I feel like this is my least favorite of her books, but the themes that she's uh, going into about lost histories and mourning sort of lost histories or, or grappling with them in terms of lost society and lost personal history. That's the stuff that uh, presents the most, I think, in the eulogy, which is uh, Station Eleven mourning our uh, current world. Uh, so anyway, uh, I talk about this book and uh, the other two books of her backlist in uh, a video uh, that I just did, and I will link that down below. Now on to what I'm currently reading, and of course I'm not as far into as I would like. Uh, this is The Leavers by uh, Lisa Ko. Um, I got this signed a couple of years ago at the uh, National Book Festival put on by the Library of Congress. Uh, speaking of adoption, it's a big theme in this book as well. Um, we are following this young boy named Deming. Uh, he is uh, abandoned uh, around uh, 10 or 11 years old by his mother and uh, his caregivers who uh, either leave or can't take care of him. He's put into the foster system rather rapidly and uh, brought to this um, very white bread couple living way in suburbia who changed his name to Daniel Wilkinson. Um, so it also goes into um, the strains of adoption and a, especially a rather unusual adoption I believe in terms of uh, uh, Deming's situation that he's um, technically an American citizen uh, born to uh, an immigrant mother who abandoned him uh, and uh, entered the system rather unorthodoxly as a, as a preteen. And I think, you know, most of these adoption stories are about uh, children as babies uh, being taken from foreign countries. Uh, I think a lot of what I've read so far is backstory stuff, and I'm sort of grappling with it. I mean, I think uh, there's legitimate uh, concerns to be made. I think there's legitimate uh, character development could, that could uh, paint the Wilkinsons as well-meaning but relatively ignorant. Uh, I don't know, they just seem so singularly ridiculous, but I really just want to smack them. <laughs> Deming on his own is a far more interesting sort of uh, co-going into his psychology about what it means to, uh, you know, have to change uh, so quickly uh, his whole outlook. He moves from, uh, you know, the, poor areas of New York City where he's uh, one of uh, several uh, in a minority uh, background, particularly he's surrounded by Chinese people, and then he goes to this white bread suburb where he's the only one. There's a lot of uh, language confusion in here about, uh, you know, about uh, Chinese languages and uh, people who can and can't speak them, mostly who can't. <laughs> He develops this uh, relationship, though, with like uh, with a Mexican American boy at uh, this white bread school, uh, and Lisa Ko goes deep into the weeds about uh, their love of music and uh, the way that uh, they experience it. It's kind of interesting. It feels like most of these chapters are backstory because chapter two was actually jumping into the future ten years, and so that felt like that's maybe where the uh, main story began, where um, actually. One of the people from Deming's uh, past uh, tracks him down and says, we found your mother, and so I'm waiting to see where that goes. <laughs> it's really too soon to, to pass too much judgment on this. I'm really trying to, you know, keep an open mind uh, as I go forward. This should be my final uh, read of August 2019. 
And then I'll be on to this book uh, for my first uh, read of September. Speaking of Chinese-inspired fiction, this is Peony by Pearl S. Buck, uh, and I will read from the back. Whose bondmaid are you? he demanded. Yours, young master, Peony answered, lifting her long lashes. You know what I cost when they bought me for you, a hundred dollars and a suit of clothes. That was when you were a skinny thing of eight, David teased. Now you're seventeen. You must be worth ten times as much. But why did you call me master? Have you changed since yesterday? Your mother told me to. Yesterday your mother said, you are not a child now. You are no longer to go to David's room if he is there, or he to yours. I do not blame you, child, for growing up. But I teach you this. Whatever happens, it is always the woman's fault. And Peony, the bondmaid, understood. Her life would be to serve, and only serve, if David would let her. And if she could. <laughs> I feel like that uh, description gave away nothing about uh, what drew me to this novel, and mostly brought uh, uncomfortable uh, gender and ethnic <laughs> relationships to the fore. I uh, added this to my TBR uh, when Sharifa from Book Riot talked about uh, Chinese fiction, uh, because this is about a uh, a family of, of Jews in China, actually, and uh, their relationships, uh, I think, with the rest of uh, their local community. <laughs> so I'll try to link that video down below. Uh, then I found it in a used bookstore a couple years ago, and uh, I figured it would be uh, apropos time to get to it, just uh, staying with thematic uh, <laughs> reading here, uh, you know, from book to book. <laughs> So that about covers it for me now. Uh, another reason why I uh, picked the most recent books that I'm reading or getting to now is because uh, this weekend I'm going to the 2019 National Book Festival. I'm so excited. Hopefully in a year I will uh, be keeping up with uh, the book I get signed there. <laughs> I also plan to attend some panels, uh, including with some BookTube Prize uh, nominees. We'll see how it goes. There's so much going on. I'm just hoping to uh, be able to get to most of what I want to do. <laughs> uh, when next you see me, I will have my uh, book haul uh, for the month, including uh, predominantly, I think, from uh, National Book Fest, although uh, most two of the books I will be getting will be for my niece and nephew. <laughs> so it'll be a children's book center call. It'll be fun. <laughs> So I hope you all are also uh, revving up for a fun weekend, uh, especially uh, in the U.S. for your long uh, holiday weekend. Thanks so much for watching, everyone, and I'll see you next time.